Welcome, everyone. This is Kevin from the Yield Lab podcast. If you're new here, every week we invite fascinating guests to cover the topics of investing, entrepreneurship, and well-being. Our guest today is Ben Shepard, co-founder at Silta Finance. Silta provides DeFi solutions for investing in the three trillion real-world infrastructure asset market. The protocol supports diligence, financing, and monitoring of renewable energy, utilities, and more. It's powered by a global community of transaction advisors, driven by passion for building a more sustainable future and world. Ladies and gentlemen, before we start, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and turn on the notifications to never miss one episode. And also keep in mind, nothing shared or discussed here is financial advice, obviously. And now that we've covered the basics, on to today's episode. Ben, why don't we start with some context about your background? So what are the key turning points in your life that define who you are today? Hi, Kevin. Great to be on the show. Hi, everyone. Uh, wow. Key turning points in my life that made me who I am today. Um, probably one of the biggest ones was uh, what originally brought me um, over to to Southeast Asia. So I did a I did a sponsored bike ride, uh, which is about five hundred kilometers from um, Ho Chi Minh City to Phnom Penh in Cambodia, and uh, I, I basically rode all through the jungle and the back areas from Vietnam to Cambodia, and it was just a sort of life changing experience. And along that journey, not only did I make like long last long lasting sort of friendships with the people on the ride, but I also saw how people live and having spent all of my life today living in the UK, everything that you need in life to then mm. saying, wow, this is how the other side of the world lives. This is, you know, this is in desperate need of, of infrastructure, of, of more support, of access to education, of all sorts of things. It was kind of this life changing experience for me. Um, and my career up until that point had been on basically structuring transactions for toll roads and heavy infrastructure in Europe, where there's already a lot of that. So you did a project, but it didn't really make a material difference to anyone's life. But having been on that bike ride, I was like, wow, I need to get somewhere where it matters. So I went back to my boss and the company that I worked for at the time. And I said, Hey, um, I see that we've got an office in Vietnam. Can I move? to be at now and work on projects for the World Bank out there building these big infrastructure deals. And he's like, well, Ben, we need to win a project there first. So I was like, okay. So I fast forward 12 months, I win a project. It's a 3.2 billion US dollar toll road, about 260 kilometers in, in length and two points in Vietnam. We won it. I go back to my boss. Can I move to Vietnam because we've won this project? Oh God, no, you've proved yourself at sales now. We need you here. That was the first point in my career where I realized I needed to be an entrepreneur. And he was, anyway, he did let me go in the end. I did get to move to Vietnam. And ever since then, I've been really sort of focused on doing things that make a material difference to people's lives. If I'm going to invest my time into my career, I want to feel like it's making a benefit to someone. And that has largely been around trying to get sustainable infrastructure built in places that matter to people. Um, so that, that was one major event in my life that, that really sort of, um, directed where I, where I am today. I met my wife in the Philippines so that obviously impacted on that as well. And then my first entrepreneurial experience of which there's been, there's been four startups. There's also been another significant point that sort of directed my career and, and it's kind of seen me do lots of things in different jurisdictions and in different industries. And, and that's been another big turning point for me. Great. So, so you, you mentioned you worked for, I think more than 10 years in transaction advisory and mm -hmm. what you're doing today has been shaped completely by this experience. So what are the key problems that you identified in the field? Yeah. So Silta is a, is a combination of what I did in my earlier career combined with the new experience I gained from working in web three. Um, and basically the, the problem that we're trying to solve is there's too many sustainability focused projects that never see the light of day. 
And the reason for that is because they can't get access to finance quickly enough. And that's just completely unacceptable in my view. If there's a project out there that makes a difference on a climate change angle, on a social angle, whatever it might be, if it's making a significant difference to the world for the better, it should get access to finance somehow and it should be readily available, but it's not. And that's the reality of today. And the what reason for that? The reason is the small projects consume a lot of DD work, due diligence work that's needed by a bank before they can make an investment decision. And the banks only have a finite amount of resource to review these opportunities and they have targets to meet. And so they focus on the bigger deals. The ones that are gold plated with government and parent company guarantees and all sorts of protections. And so these other projects that might make a meaningful difference don't quite make it. The $8 billion coal fired power plant versus the $14 million solar microgrid project is kind of like, which one, which one does the bank want to go for? Which one's going to make more return over a longer period of time when it's all about numbers and it's the other one. Yeah. So this is what we're trying to change. We're trying to make it so that banks in TradFi, family offices, foundations in TradFi, and also DeFi protocol, DAOs, stablecoin projects can all far more quickly understand whether this sustainability focused project that needs finance is a bankable project. Yeah. You know, what are the risks in there? What's the returns? What's the impact? And to get that information in front of people more quickly, and we do that through something called the Silter School, which is our due diligence tooling that we that we've been building in Silter. So before we dive into that, which is the key point today and and super super interesting and uh, innovative, what made you decide to go all in on building crypto infrastructure in the decentralized finance space? Because there's a difference, you know, between being an investor, kind of uh, uh, dipping your toes, and then saying I'm just gonna go all in and actually build. A lot of people have a normal job and invest in the space because it's yeah. less risky. So what was your thought process to just decide to go all in? Um, it's kind of, well, it, I, I found the space particularly uh, forward thinking and innovative and the traditional infrastructure industry couldn't be more different. It's like chalk and cheese. It's just completely conservative typically and very slow moving. So the fact that there was this kind of like tribe of people that are trying to do something different through decentralized finance, I found really appealing. And I found a lot of like-minded people in terms of mindset that just want to be able to do things more efficiently, better, quicker, whatever it might be. So that, that was one of the things that attracted me to, to web three. The other component of it was that, you know, what I want to do in terms of making these sustainability impacts, getting these projects through, there's a lot of resistance like the banks that are already out there because they want to focus on these, on these bigger projects, as I'd originally mentioned. So to actually, actually get them to make the step change is quite difficult and it takes yeah. time. So it's kind of like, if I want to move at the pace I want to move that, I need to be surrounded by people in an industry that are able to move at the same pace as what I want to move at. And that happens to be Web3. But I wouldn't say that we're only DeFi focused. I think Silta doesn't just want to tap liquidity in DeFi. It wants to tap liquidity in TradFi. And brilliant example. So last night we were on a call with Goldfinch. We were talking about the borrowers in our pipeline. We were talking about what would be the right sort of fit deal for, for perhaps Goldfinch. And they were saying, well, no, most of our lenders like like loan tenors that are quite short, double digit sort of interest rates. So, you know, 90 days, 180 days, maybe a year in duration, and interest rates in the tips. Um, banks, they like that too, but they also like products that are much longer in duration, um, fixed interest rates and, and low amounts of risk that go with it. So with Silta, there's this amazing opportunity where we can help the borrower go through a journey of, okay, we can help them get started by looking at getting you something called bridge financing with say a DeFi protocol. So this is a shorter term loan, higher interest rates, but it gets you started on the construction of your project. Meanwhile, working with our banking clients, we can then work on a larger size loan that might have a duration of 10, 15 years, 
lower interest rates, but ultimately allows you to finish the project. And so we can actually use the sort of benefits of both these different financing partners to actually build a better solution mm. for a borrower as they go cradle to grave through the project they're trying to construct and operate, which I think is amazing. It's using the best bits from both sides of the industry to allow borrowers to do the thing that makes the biggest difference, which is that sustainability impact. So if you had to explain Silta to your grandmother, what is Silta and how does it solve the problem that you identified in your previous career? Yeah. So Silta, first and foremost, is a due diligence protocol. So we analyze opportunities from infrastructure developers and determine what are the risks associated with the project that they're trying to build. And we present that through something called the Silta score and a due diligence report that then financing partners can express interest and make a financing offer to the borrower. So if, if the financing partner then successfully closes that deal, we then monitor the borrower as they go through construction and operations of the asset and make sure that the loan is getting repaid as it should do. So Silter in a nutshell does three things, diligence, uh, financing marketplace, and monitoring during the loan tenor. And that's the services that we basically provide to the borrower and to the financing partners. So my grandma, if she cares about sustainability, which she does, would say, oh, so does that mean that I can invest in solar projects now? And it's, yes, absolutely. You can do it through one of our D5 partners who would showcase a deal that your grandson's assessed and says, this is, this looks all right, but here's the risk, but maybe you want to consider it. And you could then go to Goldfinch or Centrifuge or one of our other partners and actually invest directly in that project. And you can make a return as well as feeling good about the fact that you're making a difference to people in Vietnam or the Philippines or Brazil or Colombia or wherever it might be. Yeah. One of the key kind of innovation and central point here is tokenizing a credit score or tokenizing a due diligence. Why, why does it make so much sense if you compare to traditional finance and what's happening? Yeah, because it can't be tampered with first and foremost. Every industry has its own little nuances that you need to be wary of. Um, and I, I strongly believe that by bringing these um, scores that we come up with that actually rates the project on chain um, and having them there immutable, I think it's very powerful to have that. And over time, as borrowers apply for more and more finance, we can use this as a track record to see how their score is changing and how they performed on previous loans and whether they can then be perhaps accelerated for eligibility for finance more quickly in the future. The other part to that is if you're a borrower seeking finance and you're, you've got a, you've got a group of say 16 different banks that are all interested in working with, with you, each of those banks might want to have their own lenders advisors. So. That means you're paying for 16 lots of different advisors for each financing party that's interested in you. Well, that's just a, that's a hell of a lot of cost and is completely unnecessary in, in, in the main because ultimately they're doing the same piece of work, but perhaps the, perhaps the bank doesn't want a certain piece of information shared about where their thinking is going or whatever it might be. So I don't, I don't really agree with that philosophy and I think just like when you want to go to get a new credit card, you can go to a credit card compare.com site and look at, oh, there's all these different credit cards. These are the terms. These are the rates, et cetera, et cetera. I think exactly the same. Here's a project. Here's the Silver score. Here's the DD report. You know, this is all the information you need about that. And then oh, here's all these financing partners that are PQ'd and they can then use that DD report to make that decision, but the exercise has only been done once instead of the borrower having to pay for that multiple times over and over again. Now, depending on where the financing party is from, they might have their own nuances within how they assess a deal. We in Silta will have, um, <clears throat> basically calibrate our model towards regions in the world. 
So severe weather conditions in the Philippines is a massive issue because of tsunamis, tornadoes, earthquakes, volcanoes, everything. They've got everything over there. Super lucky. Um, compared to perhaps, I don't know, uh, Germany or the UK or somewhere like that, where, yeah, there's severe weather conditions, but it's not known for earthquakes, tornadoes, tsunamis. So we would calibrate the model towards different regions of the world to try and take into consideration those points and make it a better fit for those financing partners. Is it only linked to the regions or is there also some, some ways that these different banking partners want to see their due diligence? Or is there kind of international regulation of what a due diligence looks like that forces these different banking partner to look at the same thing? In other words, is it really possible yeah. to have one due diligence shared across everyone? There, there's different nuances in there. Political stability is another one, for example. So depending on where you're working in the world, political stability in our, in our SILTA score would have a much higher weighting than it would in other regions. Um, like Philippines, previous president, you know, that would be a significant factor mm -hmm. to consider. Perhaps it would have been in America with the previous president as well. <laughs> so, so there's yeah. certainly things in there. But ultimately, what we produce should be enough for the banks to then use that and with their own internal model, calibrate to be able to then make a decision. So where the banks have a different opinion on certain weight, on certain risk groups, they would be able to take the outputs of our report and feed that into their own model and calibrate as well. So we've kind of, we've brought the horse to the water and they can do the last bit of, of basically getting the, the horse to drink the water, so to speak. So it's, it's taking it a long way along that journey rather than it being, there's a project we know nothing about. Mm -hmm. It's, here's a project. Here's loads of information that's already been assessed. Now take that and make your own internal investment decision. Can you tell us more about the kind of project, uh, projects that you focus on? Yeah. So we've got 300 million US dollars worth of deals in our pipeline. Um, vast majority of them are solar. Uh, we've got some wind farms in there. We've got, uh, social housing. Um, one of which is super interesting. So if there was a, if there was a severe weather event and people's homes were flooded, they would need somewhere to live. So there's basically these modular homes that can be erected super quickly, uh, for people to, to basically take refuge in. And if the flood comes back again, these homes float, so they get to seek refuge nice. on the roofs of these homes. So there's all sorts of cool stuff like that's coming into the pipeline. Um, the first few deals that we're doing are all solar focused. And the one that we've just finished DD on, um, is in the Philippines. It's 16 solar mini grids that will give power to, I think around 30,000 Filipinos on the islands of Palawan, uh, with an organization called We Energy. Um, and we're now looking to help them get financing for that deal, or at least be part of that deal. So it's quite a large one for us. So there's lots of cool stuff in there like that, that when you've finished doing the DD and you sit back and you look at it, you're like, wow, if we manage to now help these guys get finance, this is, this makes a real difference to someone's yeah. life in the future. Because at the moment they either have limited access to energy or no access to energy, or they're reliant on a coal fire power plant that might be very expensive or whatever it might be, or even diesel generators. So. It's, it's really, you know, it's really motivating to be able to do work like that as well. Yeah, I was to ask, why do you focus so much on sustainability and social impact? Why um, is it so important to you? Mainly because of my son. I want his children one day to grow up in a world that is, is, is like it is today or even better. I want them to be able to run around in a forest. I want them to be able to breathe clean air. My, my wife's from the Philippines, so my son's half Filipino, half English, and we, we lived there for four or five years. I've traveled all around the country. I spent a lot of time in Mindanao, the, uh, so say pirate part of the Philippines. I never had any trouble there. The people were lovely and took me in at the fishing port very well. But I also got to see what it's really like in those places. And 
And for me, that really struck the heartstrings. I want to be able to spend my career investing in things that make a difference. And the same in Vietnam. I, I lived there for a couple of years and we complain that, oh, electricity bill's gone up. Oh, it's getting expensive in the supermarket. Well, shit, at least you've got a supermarket you can go yeah. to. At least you've got a switch to turn the power on. You know, my heart bleeds for you. It sounds terrible. You reach people's <laughs> problems. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah entirely. Let's talk about some more personal questions. Mm. So you built a successful startup before Silta mm. infrastructure. You were, I think you told me about 34 years old, you got interviewed yeah. on CNN in the Philippines. You lived in the Philippines yeah. in a six bedroom house. You were literally living the life. You had yeah. a private cook, you had a private driver. And yeah. then overnight your life changed completely. Yeah. Can you tell us. Can you tell us about this story? What happened? Yeah. So it's my first startup from chair law and advisory that I founded with Stanley, who's actually a co-founder in Silt. Um, and, uh, yeah, we had, uh, it, it was the first one we, we were frustrated at the time, um, that the projects that we were winning with world bank, there wasn't enough money to complete the studies that needed to be done. And a large reason for that was. The big engineering firms and law firms and finance firms that worked on it just had too high an overhead. So we were like, you know, we, we need to find a better solution to this because for a million dollars, you should be able to complete a feasibility study and still have money left. Why is it for a million dollars we've overspent? That was just not right. So we had came up with this idea of, of frontier law and advisory and, and launched that company, ended up winning, um, projects with, um, Rockefeller Foundation, Bloomberg Philanthropies, um, with various different developers around Southeast Asia. And this thing, this thing took off. Um, and in the space of 15 months, it had really grown quite rapidly. Um, but there was a problem with that organization and that I'm not a lawyer, Stan is. And we basically, our business model only worked in a limited number of jurisdictions. So I said, let's then I, I'll leave this. You can grow this into more of a law firm and I'll, I'll go and set up a new startup that's specifically on the finance and engineering aspects of, um, of PPP. We can, we can just collaborate for our own startups. That's what we did and had quite a successful exit out of, out of that launched this new one, um, was growing. I think we got up to something like 18 people working for us. New president comes in in the Philippines, President Duterte, and says, right, no more PPP projects. So this is where private finance is used for infrastructure. We're like, okay, that's just killed the entire business. That's our bread and butter business. Um, and he killed it because he wanted to take loans from China and Taiwan and places like this, instead of using the local money that's already readily available to build infrastructure. So that died. I was like, okay, we're okay because we've still got business in Malaysia in the UK and a few other countries. About two months later, the same happened in Malaysia. So all of a sudden we've gone from having everything you could really dream of. Life was okay then. I'm actually happier now and I've been happier since not being quite as well off, I guess, um, because you kind of start to live in a bit of a bubble. But yeah, one would think, you know, with all those things, you know, life, life could get any better. It's not really the, the case in my opinion. But anyway, that, that business died. I accrued some debt, in fact, trying to cover people's salaries, trying oh. to keep the thing growing. I remember sitting in front of the laptop one day and I was waiting for this client to email and I had the songs playing and I say something, I'm giving up on you. I think my wife and I sat there like, do you think they'll email? I was like, I don't know. They emailed. We got a deal in. It was enough to cover the wedding and for my son to be born. So it carried us just through those bits to cover the hospital costs and, to, and for my wife and I to get married. And then towards some time after that, 2016, crypto came alive and I started to see these different projects appear. And one of them caught my eye. I bought a few tokens, wrote to them. Didn't think anything more of it. They wrote back 
and he said, we like your ideas. Could you come to Finland and talk to us about it? And I was like, okay, sure. And came over, ended up staying for three months. Then they said, can you stay a bit longer? Ended up staying for four years, I think it was, but in this project. And, and that, that's how I got into crypto as well. But that, that first startup having, having those, having those luxuries, it didn't, it wasn't when I was at my happiest. It wasn't until after I lost all that and had to start again and build it back up, but I actually found real happiness. How, how do you explain that? Found, um, um, have you thought about it? Have you thought about how you were behaving yeah, when you like, were kind of living in abundance? Like what are the, yeah. how do you explain that all these things that people strive for all their life, reaching these numbers, okay. these material things, the thing that we're all basically working so hard towards is actually not the thing that makes us happy. Why? I think, I think part of it's down to who you associate with. And as you become uh, more affluent, the people that you associate with drive you down a particular, particular route. And when you're in a place like the Philippines, the expat community is there and you can very quickly be around people that are reasonably well off, <laughs> excuse me, and, um, and sort of start to, start to take on more of those luxuries of having the cook, having the drive and everything else. But for me, the, the biggest issue was like, we had dogs, but I would find that the drive the dogs and then I would the dogs and mm. the washing up, someone else would do that. Tidying the house, someone else would do that. The cook would cook. And before, before long, you've lost touch with all these things that you normally do. <clears throat> and actually, whilst they don't, well, walking the dogs, of course, brings happiness, but, but cleaning the house, doing other stuff. <laughs> when you've got all those luxuries, um, you know, you think, you think that would bring you happiness, but then you lose touch with reality. You start to live inside this bubble, if you like. And you become lazy as well. And you expect everything to be given to you on a bit more of a plate. Then you kind of, I suppose you get a bit arrogant. You get a bit above your, a bit above your station. And then it's not until you start to lose some of that, you get to be brought back down to life. And I'm so happy it happened to me now because I think the mindset I was in before perhaps and the way that I acted before would not have been the environment I wanted to raise my son in. Whereas moving to Finland, really getting brought back down to earth by how the Finnish culture is and living in a small apartment, but ultimately being super happy because I've got my family around me and we're getting to do stuff and we're experiencing somewhere new and, and then on to Spain and sim similar situation. I'm so much happier now. I get to teach, I teach my son so many more things now and my wife and I have a better relationship now and. I left my dog and I get to walk my own dog and do all of this stuff. Like when you get to that point of having wealth, you lose touch with those things. You lose touch with reality. I, I actually wasn't very happy. I was depressed. You know, it put me into depression that combined with the, the company going down. I had counseling, you know, I'm not afraid to say it. It was a, it was a good thing. It helped me to reconnect, to rebalance yeah. my, my thinking. So when I look at Silta now, and I'm like, okay, if this thing's successful, there's this, there's potentially this big upside. Anyone who's invested for me, you know, the, you know, the opportunity is there. My wife and I talk about it. It's like, but what would we do this time if we had that opportunity again? And we're both very much agree. We would never go back to the lifestyle we had before. Sure. We might move into a nicer apartment or a bigger house. We might you know, get a, get a car, do those things, but we wouldn't want to go back into the lifestyle that we had before because you just get too disconnected from reality. So you mentioned counseling, like what did you do to readjust your life in those really hard moments? Um, quit alcohol for six months, um, did a lot more sports, took active steps to surround myself with, um, people that would support me, um, as I come out of those difficult periods, because there's those friends that 
like, come on, let's just go and have a beer. It'd be all right. And there's other friends that are like, you shouldn't have a beer. You should get your mind right. You should think differently about things. You should, you know, let's go and do something else. Let's take a bike ride. Let's go for a run. Yeah. So I took quite active steps on that stuff. I spent a lot more time kind of investing in me as well and understanding more about me because my life at that point had just been a thousand miles an hour working, 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 and then more working, working, working. It just seemed to be endless. I was a worker. Well, I still am a workaholic, but I don't think that part will ever change, but it was to a degree where it was unhealthy for. Yeah. I think I was never an alcoholic, but I certainly drank a lot more when I was stressed and quitting alcohol for that six months allowed me to re readjust. And now I have the odd beer now and then when I, when I, when I catch up with friends, but if I'm depressed, I don't drink. I have a different, completely different view on how to handle that now. So I wouldn't drink now when I'm stressed. I don't go out when I'm really stressed. Instead, I'll go to the gym. I'll play some sport, I'll take my dog for a walk, I'll play football with my son, do something with my wife, and just try to get the mind clear. Or listen to audiobooks. And there's lots of different audiobooks I listen to to kind of bring me back around and give me that grounding again when things are getting too stressed. So you change your life completely for about six months, but then you wouldn't say that you kept this complete new lifestyle going, you probably kept some of these things, but at least you developed a, a series of tools to deal with any kind of hard situation that you developed during this bad time. So you are actually much more equipped to go through the hard moments that are coming in the future. Yeah, I built, yeah, I went from one extreme to the other and then I found a happy place in the middle and had surrounded myself with, with people that genuinely care about you, just having that sort of genuine friend support network around you is a super valuable thing. And luckily for me, some of those people work in, in Silter as well. And we've got each other's backs when yeah. we need it. We actually spend a reasonable amount of time talking about mental health in Silter. Awesome. Whether it's me and another one of the co-founders or one of the other guys in the team, we have those conversations and it, it's really good. It's really positive. What do you do in that department? Which is really interesting, especially amongst uh, probably more men in this, in this industry. Mm. So what do you talk about and what do you actually advise people to do in your company to make sure this part yeah. is kind of in check? Yeah. I mean, we, we talk about everything from like a health concern or relationship stuff, or if the new baby's on the way, things to think about. And, you know, I don't want to get into the details of the things that we discussed because that's, that's personal to them, but it's kind of those, those topics. But it's very honest, you know, it's very honest. And I've told a couple of people that I'm close to, if you think I'm, if you think I'm getting to the point where I'm so stressed that I could go out and drink or do something silly, be mm. immature, or if you think that, you know, the way that I'm talking about my issues, you're concerned about me, then you ha absolutely can come and tell me that. And it's yeah. the same for them. So it's really open, candid advice that we give each other. And we're not afraid to tell one another when we think that person's in the wrong. So for example, if someone says to me, oh, why are you saying this to me, blah, blah, blah. My opinion is, I might say, I think your opinion's wrong, actually. And I think you need to see it from this end. And we're not so, afraid to do that with our, within our networks. So keeping each other kind of in check and accountable for everything and being very, very open and transparent. Yeah. Did, so did, did anyone close to you let you down when you were going through this rough time? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. There was, there was a few. <laughs> how how did you react to that? Words. And how did you bounce back? And how did this kind of change your, how you think about relationships? At the time, I don't think I reacted probably as well as I should have done. Um, I got angry and frustrated and lost my temper. Or I completely shut them out and, and didn't speak to them anymore um, because they had acted in a way that wasn't, it wasn't helpful to me. It was actually destroying me further. Um, but then since then, in some cases, I've, I've gone back and sort of analyzed the situation and realized, well, actually, 
they were going through something that perhaps means they weren't thinking totally clearly either. And it wasn't really that they were vindictively kind of advising or taking you down a road that perhaps wasn't the sensible one. It was actually that they were in a dark place and they needed help. And unfortunately, it was, it was two dark situations dragging both down. Um, and that, that was the thing. So in some cases, reflected, gone back, spoke to them, talked openly, continued to, to be friends. Um, uh, in other cases, it was, it was just a case that it was not the right sort of people to be around. Um, mm. but I think when you're, when you're going through that sort of thing, you know, when, when your companies collapse, when you're going through a difficult period, when you're under extreme stress because of a situation, you can't see things clearly. And this is a big problem. You think you can. Yeah. And if you're arrogant, you'll really push the fact that you think you can, but you can. And it's not until after the event that you see things differently. So I have this, um, this acronym that I stole from Clive Woodward, the old, uh, England rugby coach, which is thinking clearly under pressure. And I've got it written in my notepad and I write it everywhere that, that I go to remind myself to always think clearly under pressure. And two weeks ago, great example. I'm in the middle of very fierce fundraising, fierce fundraising at the moment, super stressful doing that as well as the day job. And, uh, Rob said to me, one of my colleagues, like Ben, you're stressed. And I was like, you're right. I am. I'm knackered. You know, I've been doing 14 hour days. I'm knackered at the moment. He's like, you should take a day off. You're like, you're right. So I went to Sidges for two days, the beach place just down in Barcelona. Took the Thursday and Friday off, came back on the Sunday, came back on the Monday. Felt completely revived. I only needed a short break, but felt completely revived. Came back in the office and was like, okay, ready to go again with the investors, ready to go again with everything else. And it was much better. And he was like, you know what? You're much easier to be around now as well, because you're calmer again. You know, the stress levels have come down. And likewise for him, he's got a baby on the way. So I know at some point that stress is going to really mount. It's going to be like, okay, go take a day off, you know, just de-stress a bit, take a moment, you know? So we kind of, we look out for each other in that way. And with others in the company as well, it's not just the tennis, there's others as well. What are your key learnings from this entire story? Patience, calmness. Um, <clears throat> I think the biggest learning that I've had, so I've been in a C-suite position, um, I don't know, what is it, 10 years now. The biggest learning yeah. I've got is the longer that I'm in this position, the less I realize I know. So in the early days, can become a CEO overnight when you launch a company. I was one of those guys that thought I knew it all on day mm. one. The longer that goes on, the, the more I realize I don't. And so I surround myself with people that fill in the blanks that I know that I'm not strong on. And I've really made a concerted effort to do that. So across the team, I've got people that are specialists in all the areas that I know I really am, am not very strong in. And I make sure I go to them for advice and for direction and decisions on those, those points. So a bit of humility, I guess, is, is with all of that. And, um, <laughs> my wife would laugh if I said, if I said this in front of you, but try not to take work home with you. So one way that I do that is I run home from work. It's a 10 kilometer run. By the time I finish that 10 kilometer run, I'm not thinking about work. I'm thinking about a glass of water and sitting back. So it's a fantastic <laughs> way to, to kind of get point. out of the work mode. Yeah. Into, into home mode. Yeah. Awesome. You're an avid reader. So you love to read or to listen to books. How do you, how do book, how do books help you in your day to day life? And also, when do you find yeah. time, you know, because, because reading book takes time and you need to really take the time for it. Yeah. So I'm actually a terrible reader. I'm dyslexic, um, but I listen. So because of this 
dyslexia, it takes me forever to read a book and I can't see the words and the, uh, all of this sort of connecting words. Just, it's a struggle, but Speechify, fantastic for documents and, um, audio books. So I, I go through those quite, quite quickly. Um, I've always found because, because of the stuff that I listen to, I only like business related stuff. So I don't business related stuff or autobiographies. That's kind of the route that I go down. So if I'm listening to something, it needs to further me somehow. So whether I'm listening to, uh, the trillion dollar coach, which is about this coach that helps Steve jobs and others in Silicon Valley become better CEOs, or whether I'm listening to Bob Iger on his, um, ride of a lifetime from Disney, about how he went through the positions there, becoming the CEO, becoming the chairman. There's something that I can take from those books and bring back into Shilter. And I do that regularly. So whatever I'm listening to, I try to take the key insights from it and then bring back into the organization. So we have um, one thing that we have is a pocketbook. And inside that pocketbook, it's got things about our culture, the team, what sort of defined it's got. Um, it's got these wow sort of um, guidance rules, if you like, or guidance notes, which are tips or hints or advice on how to, to manage your day-to-day -day sort of activities. And these have come from in books that I've read or listened to, and then we've brought that into it. So one of the sources for that was uh, Sir Clive Woodward's uh, book about um, business and, and rugby and how the two, you know, you can take learnings from both. Some has come from, from other things. So I try to, I don't see listening to books as, um, additional effort. I see it as something that's contributing towards the work yeah. that I'm doing because I'm basically learning from others. Um, and this is a very, I recommend it for everyone. It's a very valuable thing. What was the most useful thing that you've learned in a book? Love. Um, definitely. So the trillion dollar coach book, um, the guy that they, they talk about in there, he's a, um, ex football coach turned CEO turned business coach that advised numerous different Silicon Valley, um, CEOs. And he kind of had this slightly, um, firm approach, but he was full of love and he just gave love to his team unconditionally to help them become better at what they needed to do, but also set them firm targets and objectives and then supported them again with love to get to where they need to be. Because everyone wants to be loved. There's no one yeah. that doesn't want to be loved. No one wants to get a bollock in. I'm sorry, if I can swear on him. No, no. No one wants to get told off. You know, people don't want to know you didn't do a good job. You messed up. You know, what they want, what they want from a boss or what they want from a leader is a bit of love, a bit of help, a bit of support, an arm around them to help them do better next time. And I am really lucky that nearly every boss that I've had has been there for me and been super supportive. I actually met two of them this weekend when I was back in England from two different companies that I worked for. They came and met up with me. We had a beer, we had a great chat, but that gave me the ground that I needed. And this book really elevated that. And I, I tell my team regularly that I love them. You know, I, I, I'm quite happy to do that. I think in some of the videos that I put out Silta now on a regular basis, I, I tell the community, I love them as well, because, you know, I do. You know, if they support the project and they support the vision of what we're trying to do, which is build a more sustainable world, get more of these projects off the planet, then fantastic. And, and this is what I try to bring into the business on a day-to-day -day basis, not this stick approach, but more of, you know, show, show people some love and how, how we can do better. You still have to deliver. There still has to be results. You know, it's not, it's still, it's not, it's not turned into a, a too easy environment, you know, we still, we still have, you know, objectives to satisfy, but how we get there can either be the truth, you know, what was perhaps seen in more traditional businesses of shouting and screaming, bashing tables and doing all of that nonsense, or 
thinking clearly under pressure and showing a bit of love to the team and saying, well, how can we get through this? You know, what, yeah. what's gone wrong? How can we fix it? What can we do together on it? And, and that just makes life and work all the better. You know, I think I want to work in a company and I want people to work in a company that enjoy coming to work, not just to pick up the paycheck, but genuinely enjoy to come into the office and or, or online or wherever we might be. And, um, and to feel part of that, that family that's trying to make a difference through the work we do. What's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? No, uh, that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> okay. Before I got into, um, my proper office jobs, I, uh, I worked on building sites. So it, the, the sort of leading into university and then in the summers, I, uh, I, I worked on building sites. I, I loved it. I loved doing construction. It was fantastic. It was probably one of the most exciting parts of my career. The guy that ran this team of contractors, um, he, uh, he came up to me one day and little, little fellow smoked cigars and I was working for him. He'd given me this job, time matching. And, uh, he knew that I was at university and he, he said, I'm going to give you a piece of advice. And I was like, okay. He's like, if you're going to make it, you got to have guts. You've got to have real guts and you just got to go for it. You got to do the things that others might not be brave enough to do. You got to have real guts. I was like, okay. And that was all he said. And then he walked off. Mm. He was yeah. But it was so true. And I thought about that. It's like every time you're an entrepreneur launching a new company, you've got to have loads of courage and guts to jump off that cliff and get it done. And then, you know, whether it's launching a token or it's building a community or coming on a pond, you know, speaking to, to people on stage, you've got to have masses of courage to go and do that. And I applaud everyone that does it. You know, I, I get, I used to get super nervous as a kid. I lost all my hair when I was eight years old. I had alopecia because of a nervous disorder. Eyebrows a lot when it came back when I was 10 and 11 and then disappeared when I was 16. So I know more than many what it's like to be nervous mm -hmm. when you need to stand up in front of a group of people, when you need to do something that's super daunting. But you get through it, you have that courage, you come out the other side and you need to have lots of that as an entrepreneur, as an entrepreneur that really cares about what it is they're trying to do. So my advice is just have lots of guts, just go for it, you know, jump off the cliff, be brave. And if it goes wrong, it'd be all right. You know, it'll all be all right. It'll figure itself out, but just give it a go. What's something that you believe in that most people would not agree with? Um, Crumbs. Manchester United Football Club. <laughs> Very nice. It's a good one. I've never heard that before, but it's a good one. <laughs> uh, yeah. If there was a key takeaway from today's episode, what would it be? And um, no matter how bad a situation can seem. It will get better. Just stick at it. Be calm. Don't do anything silly. Just keep calm, get through it and come out the other side and it will all be all right. It always is. You just got to give things time sometimes and keep yourself on track. So it's been, it's probably quite tough for a lot of crypto builders out there at the moment. Well, we know it is. We're in a winter, but just give it time. And some of your projects won't make it. And. Maybe they weren't the right project in the first place, but that doesn't mean you won't have another startup or another project in future. You know, I've had four startups, one a success, one died a horrible death. The other one is still going and now Silta. So, you know, everything happens for a reason and just, just, just wait to get through the other side of it. That's a great one to end actually. This notion of, uh, that, that you learn when you do some cognitive behavioral therapy or we work on your, on your self-awareness and meditation, which is, as you said, when things are terribly, go terribly wrong, they will get better. And maybe also very important when things go amazingly well, 
they will get back to um, reverse to the mean, as we say, when we invest, basically. So yeah. it's always being very aware that when things go really bad, they will end up get, getting better. It's just like the nature and the cycles of life. And when they go really well, they will get worse. And so being aware, like kind of being able to appreciate at any moment what you have, and it's, it's kind of getting back to what you were saying, which is never really linked to a lifestyle or material possessions, but to finding ha the, the happiness that we find in the, in the basics, walking your dog, yeah. cooking, and spending time with the people we love. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you everyone for listening and watching. Please smash the like button and give us your feedback in the comment. Highlight we will post it on YouTube, Twitter, Substack, LinkedIn, and Instagram. So follow us there to get exclusive access to special content and promo codes. And I'll see you all in the next episode.